I wanted to take this opportunity to speak about a number of things that are very important to me. I was here last year giving a similar talk. How many were at that talk last year? Because I'm going to reprise a little bit of what I said, because I want to give you a sense of why I feel so strongly about some of these issues. I'm a filmmaker and a longtime DP. I've shot and directed and produced both documentary and dramatic features. When I'm doing documentary work, I love to be behind the camera. It's an artistic tool for me, and it gives me a great, a, a special pleasure that any artist can uh, tell you about. Tools are very important to artists. So the right tool and a tool that feels right is very important. And if I'm working with a camera that I don't like, it puts me in a bad mood. If I have a rig I don't like, if, I'm, if the camera doesn't balance properly, if I'm not if I don't think much of the lens, it interferes. So to me, it's a mood changer. It can enhance my mood or it can interfere in such a way that I'm not connected in the same way to the subject. Maybe a weakness, but I've always been that way. So this is the putative title of my talk today, but I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of other things too. This is just a starting off point. Shooting documentaries handheld with compact, large sensor Sony camcorders. Now, last year, I called this talk the year of living dangerously because the FS700 had just come out. It was a little baby, not even standing up yet. And the 100 had been out, FS100. Now, there are larger cameras that Sony makes, but I was interested in these for documentary. And anyone that shot documentary with a large sensor camera knows that focus is a big deal, and ergonomics is a big deal. If you've tried to shoot with a, um, a DSLR-type camera, you know all of those issues all too well. So this year, I decided to call it ergonomics a year later. And with apologies to Dinah Washington, what a difference a year makes. Now, this was my first encounter with the F3, and I was shooting a recording of Natalie Merchant, doing a Buddy Holly song produced by Peter Asher. It was a big deal to me. And these are all frames I grabbed from the, the result of that shoot. But that frame you saw of me agonizingly holding that camera is the way I looked the entire shoot. And you know that they picked up on it too. So how did this <laughs> become this? What happened? And those of you who are laughing know that that's the Aton cat on the shoulder. That was the design aesthetic of a camera that was designed around 1970-71. It's many years later, and have we gone backwards? So this was the FS700 I showed last year, and as soon as I got one, I started looking at it. It was longer than an FS100. Perhaps it could sit on a shoulder. So I just mocked up, I took the hand grip off, and I put a bar there, and you can see a screw, and I just mocked it up. And I took pictures of myself with my iPhone to see what the ergonomics look like. You see what the first problem is on the right. It's perched on my shoulder, but all the weight's out front. I tried to I put a Zacuto finder on it and tried to various sort of MacGyver things. And Juan Martinez from Sony actually showed this moose bar, Ronford Baker thing that I rigged up at NAB a year ago. So this is actually a shoot about Picasso and I don't know, I, I tried using it, but look at my posture over on the left. That just doesn't look natural. And so I tried to put a Zacuto finder on it, you know, remote finder with a battery, but everything went wrong with that because, for one thing, that finder has to have its own battery unless you've got another power source, and that adds weight, and that Noga arm, this railing arm, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really hold the weight. And as soon as that finder tilts, you start tilting. And I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's really shocking. So I was out here last year and I, uh, with Juan from Sony, I paid a visit to 3 Technica. They were 3 Technica then. And this was part of their Micron rig, very lightweight. That's an FS700, that's a Sony uh, a, a mount series lens. On the bottom, there's a magnetic, um, there's a little base plate and magnets holding that shoulder pad on. It's a really, really great design. And I jury rigged the Sony hand grip so that it still operated the camera from remote. And, you know, I was pretty happy with this. This at least worked. And the photo up at the top is from a talk I gave at HBO 
a little bit later, and I showed that, and they, they got it too. Now, the same principles of balance apply to larger cameras. And last year here at Cinegear, I took an F3 that looks like it's been, you know, made, I don't know, armor plated and demonstrated something similar. Now, what I want you to notice is that I'm holding the camera with one hand. That is how you judge good balance on a shoulder mount camera, not two hands. You're not holding a steering wheel. You're holding a camera with one hand, and that's because it's balanced. And this F3, despite all the armor plating, basically balanced pretty nicely. You'll also notice that my hand, the one that's holding the grip, is not far from the center line of the camera. It's not splayed out to the side. So again, what a difference a year makes. Uh, this was NAB this year. That was surprised to see a picture of me. That's an early F55. But look, there's a wooden hand grip that my hand is covering up. So that's a heck of a lot different than a year ago. And what's past is prologue. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to catch you up on a few other things. Why are we even bothering with large sensor cameras if we're shooting documentaries? Because everybody here probably understands that if you shoot with a two-thirds inch camera or one-third inch camera, everything's kind of manageable focus-wise. So why put ourselves through this torture test to try to keep focus all the time? Well, there actually are some interesting reasons which is why I've switched over. And once I switched over, I haven't gone back to smaller sensor cameras. For a while, I was carrying both a large sensor camera and a small sensor camera and switching back and forth. But then I just gave up on that. So for one thing, Super 35 format, 124 years old, was created in, or made available to the public in 1892 and really hasn't changed since. And just by the way, Super 35, if you don't know this, is about the same as APS-C in still cameras. And that becomes important when you have a lens that can cover an APS-C camera and you're concerned whether it covers your Super 35 camera, and the answer is yes. Now, 4K is a resolution of Super 35. Kodak determined this in the 80s. That's where 4K comes from. It doesn't come from the electronics industry. It comes from the motion picture industry examining 35 millimeter color negative for its native resolution. Now, it turns out that we could actually use more than that. But in the 80s, that's what was understood to be the amount, 4096 pixels across. And so I'd like to make an argument that Super 35 format capturing 4K equals cinematic. But there's a problem with that argument. And by the way, that's another reason why I would want to shoot with large sensor cameras. I want to use the original film format. Imagine that, 124 years old. 35 millimeter projection never delivered more than 1.3K to the screen. I don't care who it was. I don't care who shot it. I don't care what theater you saw it in. And I don't even care if you were watching dailies. It was impossible. Jitter in the projector, buckling in the gate, uh, loss of contact and contact printing. You start to add up the list, and you're amazed that they even achieved this much. But it didn't matter. And that's kind of interesting, too. You could feel focus and detail that perhaps wasn't measurable. That's an interesting thing about motion pictures. Video is something different, and digital images, as you know, are something different. They don't have moving grain. Um, every generation looks exactly the same as every other generation. But it's new to see 4K on a screen. We've never seen that before. But this brings up another argument in favor of these large sensor cameras. 4K cameras, even if you don't want to go through the post-production issues of 4K, make the best HD cameras. You're oversampling. You're super sampling every image, and the images look just spectacular. Uh, which cameras have 4K sensors? Well, the FS700 has a 4K sensor. The F55 and F5 have 4K sensors. So I told you I was going to take you to a number of different places. I was at Sundance this year, and I actually added up what all the cameras were that were used at Sundance. It's rather interesting, and my whole point of showing you this is to point out that the industry is still in a lot of flux and a lot of transition, and the dust hasn't settled. So none of us have the answers completely, and there's no mainstream anything. Although, you'll notice I labeled my article Alexa Rising, because that was the story this year. All the television and whatnot, and it's a brilliantly designed camera. Now, there are a lot of different approaches to these large sensor cameras, different shapes and sizes. I started my quest some time ago. This is actually not a large sensor camera, but it's digital. This is uh, Jeff Krinas. And that's the legendary Kinetic camera. This was at NAB in 2005. This 
gave rise to many of the bayering techniques and so forth that then commercially succeeded with the red camera company. At the bottom, Jeff had a lot of innovation in this camera, and one of his innovations is that the viewfinder detached with that coiled thing, and like I'm looking at myself and he's filming me. A lot of innovation in this camera. That camera, I was supposed to shoot a feature with the very first model of that camera, but the camera never got finished because Jeff didn't make the sensors, which is a problem. If you're going to go out and do a Kickstarter campaign and build a camera, you better be aware of that. Uh, Jean-Pierre Boviala of Aton has just recently kind of acknowledged the fact that they're having problems with sensors, too. Um, I may get back to that a little bit later. Other cameras I looked at, that was, that's a Penelope, an Aton Penelope. Nothing really hit. Now, this you'll recognize because you've been reading all the trades and watching the internet coverage. You'll know this is an F55 from Sony. And look at the long shape, which parallels an Alexa. And there's a reason for that. Now we're getting back to shoulder mount ergonomics. Uh, you'll also notice there's a Fujinon Cabrio lens, which has a motor drive for the zoom. Now, ergonomics is an applied science. It's actually a serious study. Uh, it maximized productivity, blah, 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 but that's MBA talk. Basically, the idea is when you put something in your hand, if it's ergonomic, it feels right, and you connect to it, and that's very important. And a lot of people don't understand that, and, and it confounds me how we could have built ergonomic cameras in the past but not in the present. Any camera can be bolted to a tripod head. Few cameras can balance on a shoulder. That's a special design. Or be comfortably held in front of you for any length of time, and, and you know what I mean, using your arms as a steady cam arm. Uh, simple and light is good, too. Uh, wooden cameras didn't weigh very much. Now, we get into lots of strange places and stressful positions. And that's why camera manufacturers who don't design ergonomic cameras uh, they don't get my vote because you pay for those bad designs. You may not in the showroom, and you may not, I don't know, on a set where you've got lots of assistants helping you, but you're going, if you're shooting documentaries, at some point you're going to pay for that design. Uh, here are some of my candidates for epic fail. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, Grant's a friend of mine, but, you know, not for documentary. Uh, really? Um, Okay, you're flying that with both hands. Uh, how are you touching anything else? I don't know. I mean, it looked good on the show floor at NEB. Uh, I tend to take pictures a lot of things that amuse me, so these are all rigs that I just thought were ridiculous. Uh, look at this guy. <laughs> this was a couple of years ago at NEB. By the way, that's a 5D Mark II or three on that thing. This is a guy at the Berlinale. I gave a talk this year on digital cinema cameras, and that's a Canon C. 300 probably, but look at his posture. Something's not right. Could it be what he's looking at? This is another ridiculous winged camera. This is the most, you know, the minute I saw this at Red years ago, I, I, I wrote Red off, and that's really prejudicial on my part. But what, what design went into this? Now, this was at NAB this year. It's like, what the hell? Really? Uh, where's Seth Meyers? Um, that's a, what, a FS100? I mean, this was just at a, a dedication of a new documentary theater in New York City. And I noticed this guy running around with a shape rig. And he's got a, I guess that's an FS700. You know, but again, look at where his hands are. Look at how he's, the fact that it's front heavy, he's supporting the rig with his right hand. It just, it's, again, it's confounding to me. So these guys are uh, perpetrators. You know who that is. Uh, the Quest, part two. Ah, viewfinder. Been a big problem. A lot of the cameras that F3 that was squunched against my head didn't have a proper viewfinder. It was not in the right place. And that's extremely important. It, not only should it be sharp and bright and clear, but it connects you to the image. If you don't feel good looking through the viewfinder, you're not going to feel good shooting, and your work's going to suffer as a result. I guarantee it. And I've been going through this for years. Optical finders, when they were sharp, were just brilliant. I mean, you just were amazed at how beautiful the images were as you were shooting. If you use a DSLR today that's still an optical DSLR with a pentaprism, you know what I'm talking about. You know, when you bring that image into focus, it's glorious. It's never glorious with these. 
At best, it's adequate. Now, fortunately, Sony's come out with an OLED finder. What's so good about OLED? Well, as you know, blacks are black. So that means that at least the contrast is more or less representative of what you're really capturing. And the F5 and the F55 feature this. And I've been using it, and uh, I can tell you it's, it's really pretty good. I'm, I'm happy with this. My only comment would be, I wish this were on all the cameras. I wish this viewfinder could switch from camera to camera to camera in the Sony line. I wish you could put that on an F3 um, or anything else. Now, this was the introduction in January of the F55 and F5 at Abel Cine in New York. And again, I just take images. And I don't know why, but I always find a use. And I noticed later when I was looking at this, look at all the cables coming off that. I don't know what that's all about. I mean, I know what they're doing, and I know why, but I don't know why that's supposed to be impressive. Because when I walk in, if I see a small camera, I'm impressed. I'm not impressed by that. In fact, I walk away from that. It's too much complexity for me. Now, I wanted to show you what a F55 and by the way, an F55 Sony and an F5, they look exactly the same. I mean, there's almost no distinguishing, there's no scar, there's no distinguishing mark. It's very hard. To, they're like twins. You can't tell them apart. So I'm going to call this an F55 because it is, but it could just as easily be an F5. On the bottom is an FS700. And I wanted to make an interesting point. We've reached about the smallest size these cameras are going to get. Look at them underneath. Now, now, you would think that the camera on the left might be the more expensive, more sophisticated camera. Not really. Look at them from the back. That gives you more of an indication of which is, is the more expensive. Whoops. Look at them from the front. Kind of, it's just interesting. You start comparing these things, and you realize that the ergonomic issues of these two cameras are actually very much the same. And they're about the same length. They're about the same size. And you'd have to mount them about the same way. And just for the heck of it, uh, here's an F55 and an F3. And by the way, they both have that big FZ mount in the front. The F3 actually introduced that mount, and it allows you to use lots of different types of lenses on these cameras. But again, they're about the same body size. That F55, by the way, that's a big difference. You see that there are batteries on both of these, and you see what the difference in the draw is? That's interesting. To me, it is, at least, because the battery adds weight. Now. One thing that is going to make everything different, two things. We are on the verge of this 4K world. And I said earlier, you don't have to shoot 4K with these cameras. But if you decide to, you've got a lot of different choices, increasingly, as of this year. And one of the choices is that, that Sony just um, introduced at NAB the first compression for 4K. And it's an uh, H.264 compression. It's very high profile, and that allows you to actually record to a uh, S by S card inside the F55, 4K, which is kind of amazing. Um, it's compressed, but it, it, you have to see it. It really looks good. Now, if you wanted to record beyond that, if you want to record raw 4K, this is a little guy called the R5 that Sony just introduced when they introduced the F5 and F55, and it's modular. You see, I'm holding it in my hand so you can see the size of it. It doesn't weigh anything. And this captures 4K RAW, which is kind of amazing. You have to use a new kind of card. It's 512 gigabyte. It's kind of interesting that a lesson's been learned. There's only one size, 512 gigabyte. I think the lesson is that when you have too many sizes of cards, you start juggling them and you get confused and you, you, anyway. Sony's not the only company that has standardized on 512 gigabyte. I find that kind of interesting. There's a rig on this camera that I'll get back to in a moment, but I want you to see, this is the F55. There's a battery on the end. That's the backside of that R5. Battery, 4K recorder, camera. And what else do you see on this? Isn't that a Canon lens? In fact, that's this Canon lens right here, this L-series lens. It's a 24 to 105, and it's their kit lens, which they now make available with the C300, and that's because it's such, or with the C100, rather. That's because it's such a good lens, and it is. I've used it. It's a really great lens. Well, what if I wanted to use a Canon 24 to 105 on, a, on an F5? Why not? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. And 
what, what have I done by using a lightweight zoom lens? I've lightened the camera. You don't see any cables coming off of this thing. You don't know what I'm shooting here. You can't tell just by looking. You can presume, because I've got the R5 on it, that I'm interested in RAW. I could pop that R5 off. The R5 is the same size as this battery. Just push the battery against the camera. I'd have even a smaller unit. So now we're in a different place than we were a year ago in terms of ergonomics. The camera itself is almost by itself ergonomic. I could almost get away without the shoulder pad and any of this business down here. Uh, look at that, a wooden hand grip. We're going there. Now, just very quickly, some of the differences between the 5 and the 55 are worth mentioning. But my point is, and don't absorb this too much, you can get a brochure on this or look it up on a web page. The point is that both of these cameras do a bunch of different codecs. XAVC, which is that 4K compression, uh, MPEG-2, they're very, very qualified cameras. You could go low end to high end with the same camera. That's kind of interesting. Uh, this is the F700, which I've hardly mentioned in this talk, because the F700 has been around. It was introduced a year ago when I was speaking, but there's a difference. You probably know that the F700 can look, output 4K RAW now, and 2K, and high frame rates, 4K and 2K. And what is that all about? That's about that little R5 recorder that I just showed you. There's a little interface box that you attach to that little R5 recorder, and all of a sudden, the FS700 that you may have already bought, it needs an upgrade, but it will do 4K and high-speed 4K. That's kind of interesting. Now, I, I promised we'd talk about hand grips. Um, hand grips are very important. This is a picture I just dug up of myself. This is in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and it's probably 1983, I'm guessing from the hair. And if you look closely, what is this over here? This is an Aton wooden hand grip, which I was never without. Like everybody shooting back then, I used both SRs, Aeroflex SRs, and Aton LTR7s. But given a choice, I walked away always with the Aton. Why is that? That camera, you put it on your shoulder, and you were just happy to keep it there. That's why the cat on the shoulder trade symbol, if you will, was created, because it's really true. And the guy that developed that, and, and this is a later uh, XTR prod, uh, with a different kind of handle. They put a hole in it and they put this thing. I like the original handle, which didn't have a hole in it. This is Jean-Pierre Boviala, who just won an award from the uh, French uh, Cinematographers Association. I forget the initials. Uh, this year, uh, he's always been an amazing person. He's been a friend of mine for many years, and I, I, he's one of the people in the industry that I, I deeply admire. Everything in his design is thought through from a design aesthetic. Um, that could be another lecture. So, hand grips, Aton. Aton created an ergonomic grip that fit in your hand. It's as if you took a clump of clay and just squeezed it. And that's what an Aton hand grip felt like. But what was special about that hand grip? It was a certain size, and it had another feature, too. It hooked over your thumb. Well, why would you want that for control? See, hand grips do a bunch of things. Uh, I'm going to suggest in a moment that hand grips should be like a mouse on a computer. They should be intelligent and they should be controllers, which they're not right now. Most of them are dumb. But they, sh they also help you control the balance of the camera. You're tilting up really fast. Someone bumps into you in a crowd and the camera goes flying. Well, it doesn't go flying if you're holding an Aton hand grip because the grip forms itself into your hand. Now, how does it do that? This happens to be a Vocas grip, V-O-C-A-S, and it's the best grip I know of uh, since Aton, and it come, I shouldn't say that. There's some others, and I'll show you, but it's a very good one, and I'm enthusiastic about it. It comes from uh, the Netherlands, and by the way, a Aton also created the very, its first hand grip out of walnut. So are all the rest of these, for some reason. So every time you see any wooden hand grip on any camera, it's descended from the original Aton hand grip. And before the Aton hand grip, there was nothing like it. And any of you who were shooting back then know what I'm talking about. Um, so see how this Vocus, it, it's got this like glob that kind of spills over your thumb. And the point again is that if you've got a heavier lens in front of you for some reason, it allows the weight of that to rest on your thumb. Um, you can't have the camera knocked out of your hand as easily. You're just in control. The camera just fits onto you, and, and you know I like that. 
Now, this is another hand grip that's just come out this year. In fact, this is Caleb Crosby, who some of you may know. And he just, this just came by uh, FedEx this morning. This is his hand grip. This is considerably larger. And I was doing a shoot last week, and I, and I had another version of this, and I passed it around. And I don't know why, but all the guys like this, and the women weren't so sure. And I think that's because it's really big, um, big macho-y kind of hand grip. But this is the same idea. Look at the size of the hook for the thumb on this thing. I mean, this feels like it should be a, a, a gun control or something. I don't know. But this has a, a couple of distinguishing features. Um, it has a wooden button right here, and it has three wooden buttons right here that are not assigned yet. It's got a connector down here, and I was supposed to have a version. This will start and stop of F5 and F55, um, but this one has a brain in it, and what they call what Caleb calls a brain, and it's this little circuit board that's inside. This is an intelligent hand grip, which brings up a topic that to me is very, very important. Hand grips need to be intelligent. You need to have access to all kinds of things through a hand grip. This is from Canon. This is what's on the C300 and C100. Did Canon get it right? Partly. Partly. There, this is a start-stop button in the front. This controls the iris. Uh, this is a, a, jo a um, jo um, what do you call it, a, a joystick controller. And this is assignable, but this tends to be used for magnification. Now, at first thought, you go, wow. But you use it, and the reality hits you. A couple of things. You put your hand, because it's not ergonomically shaped to the hand, not really, you put your hand in this thing here, and that constrains your hand. You can't get your finger actually easily up onto this dial. Furthermore, and I'm going to argue that everyone in the industry is wrong about something, the most important thing you need to have on your hand grip is the button that enlarges the image so you can check focus. In large sensor cameras, focus is the thing you're most concerned about all the time, and that it's true of every kind of shooting there is, and it's particularly true of documentary. I can't underscore that enough. So let's think ergonomically, as if we're designing this as a, an applied science. So wouldn't we want to put the button that is used the most under the index finger, which has the easiest access? Of course we would. So that would mean that this should be the magnification button. That's what you're going to check 30 times every two minutes. I do it all the time. What's the last button that you want to have access to? Because you're only starting and stopping once during every shot. Well, that button can go in the back or any other place. It doesn't need to be under the index finger. So I don't know why everyone's gotten that wrong, and I mean everyone. No one's gotten that right. Um, if you're going to do this kind of thing, the dial is a wonderful idea, but again, it's, it's inconveniently and awkwardly placed. It looks great in brochures, but try using it. Um, maybe some of you have. It just hasn't, been, it hasn't worked very well for me. But I want to give them their due. Now, Mitch... Uh, Gross, that many of you know from Able Cinetech, who does those wonderful videos. Mitch has come up with this. Now, Mitch is an old Aton guy, uh, and you see the fingerprints of Aton all over this. But he's done something else that's kind of brilliant. Why, I said earlier that you should be able to control a camera with one hand if it's properly balanced. Why would you want that? That's because you want the other hand free to focus manually focus or zoom or touch a button or something or maybe fend off someone who's attacking you. You want a free hand. You don't want to be steering a steering wheel on a bus. So look what Mitch has done. This thing is reversed, but if you can turn it around in your mind, you see it's got the thumb hook. It, look at the, the, the sort of sinuous curves of the thing. It's a little odd, but it fits the hand. Now what's that that growth on the other side all about? Why would you want a um, golf ball on the other side of your, of your grip? Well, that's because if you know, if you're shooting, I don't have a camera here to demonstrate it, but you've got your hand in, one, in the grip, and what are you doing with the other hand? You're usually both focusing and at the same time supporting a little bit of weight and stabilizing the camera. That's what that's for. It goes right in the ball of your palm, if there's such a word. And it stabilizes, and I think this is brilliant. Now, what does it lack? I don't see any buttons, because remember, a hand grip should be a mouse. 
It should give you control to most of the functionality. You're shooting a documentary, something's happening, and you need to change something on the camera. Really, you're going to take the camera off of your, and then look at the side, and oh, there's that button, and, and then put the camera back on your shoulder in the middle of a shot? Come on. So that's what we've been given all these years by camera designers, and I still can tell who has ever held a camera before. You can see it in the design. The only one I know is, is Boviala. Um, and you can, again, you can see it in the design. Now, here's another kind of hand grip. It's, it's walnut. It comes from my friends at 16 by 9. I have one here. It's lacking the thumb thing, so that's a problem. There is a button, and there will be some kind of ability to start and stop things with a little connector here. Uh, one button doesn't thrill me because I know what this is going to be. It's going to be start and stop. But there's another problem. Look what's happening in my hand. See how my little finger's going under it? it it's, you know, it's not, honestly, not really good enough to just sort of plane off, you know, the sides of this thing and round them a little bit. Ergonomic is something that you, when it feels right, you know it. So we've made a lot of progress in the last year. These are other, this is what I just showed you with 16 by 9's thing. Now rigs. Um, this is me with a shape rig. Now shape makes beautifully machine components for their rigs. And the red buttons mean that you can press a button and you can move really fast. You can, you can swing those handles around. But you can already guess that what my issues might be with this. For one thing, when I'm shooting, I don't want to swing the thing around in 50 different configurations. I want to kind of find one that works and leave it there. That's just me. Another thing, look at what I'm doing with my left hand. I'm doing something weird with my left hand. And what that is, is look at how splayed my arms are. When you get your arms splayed out like that, the whole thing rocks. You can't stabilize it. You may not believe that, but, but try it. Try it over time. It doesn't work. The, uh, my right hand's in totally the wrong position. Forget about the fact that it's, it's a dumb grip. It's in the wrong position. So I, tr I tried to make the best of it. What if someone handed this to me and I had to use it? What would I do? Because with my right arm splayed out like that, I can't control the stability of the camera. So with my left, what I did was I, I pushed the handle up. I'm doing a version of what Mitch Gross did. I'm resting my hand against that, and you see I'm controlling the focus via the focus knob. That kind of works. But I, uh, you know, again, if you look at me here, I'm not particularly happy. And also, look up here. And again, I want to stress, this is an F55, and this is an OLED finder. And, and I generally really, really like this finder. And it has a button for magnification. If you want to magnify the image to check focus, now you're in the middle of a shot, something's happening, you're walking along, trying to follow someone, and, and really, you're going to take your hand off the lens where you need to be focusing and reach up and press that button, which you can't remember where it is, and, and then and, and, and knock the camera in the process? Come on. So that's another one of those crazy things. I mean, it's there, and it's good. And if the camera were on a tripod, no problem. It's a great place for that button to be. So I hope that there will be a way to control that. Um, and maybe there is one. I don't know about that. But these are the things that we, people who you know shoot live and die by. Now, this is the, the company Vocus that I mentioned earlier. They're, they're the ones who have the really good hand grip, which I like. And it's more than that. I like the, this light. This is very high-grade aluminum. You know, aluminum comes in a 1,000 different grades in alloy mixtures. It's very high-grade, and it's beautifully machined. And usually, I don't like double-jointed things like this. This was so rock-solid. I mean, I wanted one. I, I didn't want to give it back, frankly. Also, look at uh, how, how minimal these plate configurations are. This is all the right idea. Now, I'm going to try something really quick. I shot a bunch of photographs of me holding rigs made like this. Uh, they're in a different program. So could you switch over now? I'm going to show you a few photographs. Uh, while he's doing that, I just want to underscore that since I gave this talk last year, I, I have to talk about very different things now, because many of the things that I was upset about ha are being addressed. The frustrating thing for me is that they're not being optimally addressed. You know, if someone gives you a solution, but the solution is, is like half-baked, then they feel you should be grateful, and you feel they didn't go far enough. So we need to keep pressure on the industry. This is the F55, and again, I commend Sony for the shape of this camera. They paid attention. 
uh, you know, they only came out with the F3 two years ago. Look at the differences. Someone's been thinking, someone's been watching, and, and I appreciate that. Now, this is the F55 with just a battery. See how tiny that is? You could almost hold that on your shoulder. And remember, back in the days of Aton and, and using Ari SRs, we didn't have shoulder rigs or pads or anything. We just put it on our shoulder. CP16, it just went on your shoulder. It was a box. So that can work. And again, what makes this possible? Hey, I've got this Canon lens, and I'm going to show you how I got that Canon lens on there in just a moment. I'm holding it up. Now, I couldn't hold this camera like that if it were very heavy. So I just want you to appreciate that. And it has the OLED finder on it. This is a Vocus grip, and this is a single Vocus extension. And this is a Vocus, I'm pretty sure this is a Vocus plate. Yeah, it is a Vocus plate, yeah. Because, and it has a, holes for rods in the front and in the back. But I'm happy. Now, I've got the R5 recorder that records 4K RAW on it now. Other cameras rely upon third-party recorders that require usually you know, multiple cables, an additional expense and additional rigging issues, they're all gone here. This is a very, very slick design going forward. Again, oh, this is, this is the FS700, which I've been neglecting a little bit. There it is, and I've just attached a, a Vocus uh, rod and grip directly to the camera because it has an Aria rosette on it, and it works like a charm. I was really happy with that. Now, I'm getting a little more adventuresome here. This looks like the 16 by 9 hand grip. In fact, it is, because this is their design. Um, I, can, I can tell by looking at it. And also, I want you to notice something else. I've got this humongous lens on here, and this is a Canon compact cinema lens. It's a 15.5 to 47. It kicks ass. It's just a little bit big for us, but it was perfectly comfortable. And that's what you'll experience. If you get a rig that is comfortable and fits you, suddenly the weight of the lens isn't so bad. Um, in fact, I think that lens weighs about the same thing as the rest of the camera does. But until recently, I mean, you wouldn't expect to see a Canon lens on a Sony camera. Now, this was fun. This is a Canon Prime lens, cinema lens. And these are also great lenses. And they've got like this huge 300 degree rotation for focus, which is important when you're working with crews and you're pulling focus. But um, it's also a first, an incredible lens. I mean, all of these lenses were designed by Canon as it became clear that 4K was imminent, and they're really, really uh, highly designed. And they're mechanically great as well. And again, I've got a little Vocus thing here, and I could almost run and gun with this. Now, what am I missing? Obviously, I'm missing a viewfinder. And I wish the Sony OLED would work with this. It would be a little pricey. It might cost more than the camera, but that would be the solution. Oh, look at this. What have I got? I've got a, um, a Cook uh, S4 Mini, Mini S4. Really great lenses. I have to say, I've just been working with them and testing them in really great lenses also. But how did I get that on? Because aren't Cook lenses PL mount? And isn't this an FS700? Well, Vocus to the rescue. Look at what's going on here. I've literally got the camera on my shoulder. This mount, which is an E-mount to PL adapter, is holding a Cook Looks like it's a, I can't read it, it's a 50 millimeter a Mini S4. And the mount drops down with an ability to hold these rods. And you know what? You might say, that's insane. Why would you use the lens mount to support everything else? But you know what? It worked pretty darn well. I was really impressed by this. I just was just playing around and I said, why couldn't that be? So look. If I had a viewfinder, wouldn't this be a fantastic lightweight camera? And imagine I had a little tiny light lens on there. And now we're shooting like 240 frames a second, and it gets interesting. There's just a lot you can do now. This is another version of the same thing. You can see, I mean, it's a very compact design. This now shows you what I did. I'm using this to hold everything in front, and these two pieces are bonding together like that. I don't know if Vocus intends that, but I thought it was cool. Now, what Vocus also did is they've created a riser. And if you add this riser into this rig, now you can put the camera properly on a base plate. And now the camera properly is being supported by the base plate, and so is the lens mount. And again, I've got a cook on it, and again, it accepts a PL mount. 
So there's no longer any reason that you can't put any kind of lens on any of these large sensor cameras, but in particular on these Sony cameras. Uh, what have I got there? Oh, this is important. Remember I said that the F700 can now capture 4K and 2K RAW? Well, obviously it needs to use that R5 recorder. Here's the recorder back here. And here's a battery back here, but there's this weird thing with a handle. What is that? Well, that's an interface. It's called an IFR5. I think I got that right. And it's required to interface the R5 recorder with the little AXS blue card to the back of the camera. Now, there's no join here. There's actually a gap because I've got the rear rods coming out here and there's a quarter 20 hole on the bottom of this interface box. And so it's like I've got one build on the front of the camera off of the rods and another build off the back of the camera. It was still pretty manageable. It's starting to get long, but it's still pretty manageable. Here's a side view of the same thing. And because it's got weight in the back now, I need more leverage in the front, which is why I'm perfectly happy to extend the hand grip further forward. That's just a leverage issue, and you, you figure those things out pretty quickly. Okay, and it's just other examples, and again, I've got a Cook Prime, and this shows you how it broke apart and how I put that unit on the back of that. And this shows you the interface box, the IFR5, and the R5 recorder. This is actually the interface box, and you can see it has some controls for playing back 4K and 2K, and this is the actual recorder with a chip in it. There's the quarter 20 hole I used. It, by the way, it's slightly compressed raw coming out of the FS700, which means that you don't need two 3G SDI cables, just one 3G SDI cable, which is really convenient. I already found, I went to B&H and I found a one foot high quality uh, 3G SD, um, BNC cable. And um, I fa found L connectors. So you'd want to put an L connector on this and a one foot cable and a second L connector, and then and it'd be a really, really neat package. I'm really allergic to cables. The more I can get rid of, or the fewer, the better. And these are just additional views. I think this is where we started. So can we switch back to the PowerPoint? Lenses, important. Um, this was seen at NAB. Do you remember that silver lens that was on the front of the FS100? Every it, You've seen them all over the place. I call it the silver bullet. Sony actually came out with a black version that doesn't look so consumerish, and it, more than that, it has servo motors in it to drive the zoom. So you can actually drive this thing. Here, here's a close shot of the lens. Look how tiny that is. It's an 18 to 200. 18 to 200 covers Super 35, and it's even got a little zoom switch on the side, and it actually works. Now, you know, it is what it is. All lenses are compromises. They're bundles of compromises. But for what this thing is, and it has image stabilization, and as cheap as it is, it's something you ought to think about. Um, I, I, I'm a lens snob, and I, I, I like avoided it for a while, but I, I was eventually won over um, it by its conveniences, endless conveniences. This is a Fujinon Cabrio 19 to 90. It also has a, a, a servo uh, to drive the zoom. Um, with all due respects to my friend Jeff Boyle, uh, I think there's a, there's a place for this in the world. And again, once you have the ability to zoom with these cameras, it, it really makes possible those kind of slow zooms and pans that you, you did very easily back in two thirds inch days. Another cool thing, because of this FZ uh, mount in the front of the F5 and the F55, you can adapt all kinds of other things. This is a Canon adapter from Optitech, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. This is a Nikon adapter. This is a PL mount adapter, um, and so forth and so on. And again, who makes more lenses? Now, this is a really important thing. I happen to love Canon lenses. What don't they make? And they're also making cinema lenses, because I've just shown you a bunch of their cinema lenses. So now you have access to those. Um, I shouldn't, this reads like an ad. I don't mean it to be. I just admire, I'm a lens guy, so I admire what goes into these lenses. Um, Metabones has made a little adapter for E-mount to EF. And that, if you look, you see these contacts. And that means that when you put the Metabones adapter on your camera, here's the FS700 with the E-mount. 
here's the FS700 with the Metabones adapter, suddenly all that information coming out of these lenses is available and you can control them to some, some degree. Depends upon the lens. Um, again, this is that Canon kit lens that's on an FS700. The image stabilizer right here, I just want to point out, is built into the lens. That's an important point. If you want that kind of thing, if you're doing a lot of handheld and you've gotten used to image stabilization, it's in the lens. Uh, this is a wee tiny uh, 52, I'm not sure, what is it, pancake? But the point is that it's a wee thing. And it's another one of these millions of wonderful, there are over 60 different EF lenses that I'm aware of. And that doesn't count the you know, tilt shift lenses and other things that they make that are rather unique to Canon. Now, Optitech has made um, a EF adapter that plugs directly into the FZ mount, which is really interesting. Look how tiny this is. And you see this plug coming out? Well, that has a significance. I'll get to that in a second. Look at, you've got some control of the lens built into the adapter. This is what the adapter looks like sideways. You see contacts right there. And now you see that's how I was getting these lenses. Remember I said I had a secret uh, onto the F5, F55 rather. But this is the really cool thing. This is such a sophisticated adapter. You have control of these lenses. If these lenses are controllable electronically, uh, you can control them. Juan Martinez is here from Sony. Um, he's got more experience on this than I do and can answer your questions later. Um, right tool for the right job. I'll see you here next year.